Welcome to the Solar Decathlon Building Science Education Series. I'm Paul Tursellini, and in this episode, we'll talk about some of the most common technologies used for heating water. We'll also go over some best practices for saving energy with water heating systems. In our episode on the science of water heating, we talked about the amount of energy needed to heat water. It's really a function of how much water you need to heat and how hot you need to get this water. And so in this episode, we're going to talk about different ways to do this. The types of hot water heaters we'll talk about are storage water heaters, tankless or instantaneous water heaters, and heat pump water heaters. We'll also briefly mention solar water heaters. Storage water heaters are one of the most popular types of water heating systems, particularly in residential and smaller commercial buildings. In general, water is heated and stored in a tank. The hottest water is at the top of the tank, so hot water is often drawn from the top of the tank and cold water comes into the bottom of the tank to replace it. A single family storage water heater uses a storage tank, typically 30 to 80 gallons. This allows the hot water to be produced at a slower rate than its maximum draw, as hot water is often consumed in large quantities fairly quickly. Consider everyone in a house taking a shower at near the same time or having to fill a bathtub a few times. Since water is constantly heated in the tank, energy can be wasted even when hot water isn't being used in the building. This is called standby heat loss. By insulating the storage tank, you can significantly reduce standby heat losses and operating costs. Fuel sources for storage water heaters include natural gas, propane, fuel oil, and electricity. Gas and oil water heaters typically look something like this. There is a burner underneath the bottom of the water tank which provides heat. Flue gases from combustion are vented through a chimney that goes up through the center of the tank. As cold water is added to the tank at the bottom, it is heated by the burner and by the hot exhaust gases. The hottest water then is at the top of the tank, so the hot water outlet is located at the top. And lastly, you'll see a thermostat and a gas valve somewhere on the side of the tank. This allows users to set a hot water set point and the thermostat measures the temperature of the water in the tank to determine how much heat is needed to get the water up to the desired temperature. Like the combustion-based heating systems we discussed in another episode, the venting of combustion gases in gas and oil water heaters means that there are associated energy losses that occur. Electric resistance water heaters use the same type of tank with cold water inlet going all the way to the bottom of the tank and hot water outlet located at the top. However, instead of a burner at the bottom and a flue gas heat exchanger, the heating elements consist of electric resistance coils at the top and the bottom of the tank. These are used to help maintain consistent temperature throughout the tank, throughout the water that is in the tank. And then, even though electric resistance water heaters don't have combustion losses, electricity purchased from the power grid loses a significant amount of energy before it gets to the building where it is used. Heat pump water heaters then look a lot like electric resistance water heaters, just with a heat pump added on top of the tank as the primary heating device. Electric resistance coils are typically still included as auxiliary heat. As we discussed in the HVAC heat pump episode, heat pumps use electricity to move heat from one place to another instead of generating heat directly. Therefore, they can be two to three times more efficient than conventional electric resistance water heaters. We have to remember that as heat pumps extract heat from the surrounding air, it will cool the surrounding space. If you located a heat pump inside the house, it will cool and potentially dehumidify the house. So not only do you get the benefit of heating hot water at two to three times the efficiency of an electric hot water heater, you also get cooling and dehumidification. 
There is no free lunch here, however. If the space needs heat, you need another source of heat, either a heat pump that brings in heat from the outdoors or a typical fossil fuel boiler or furnace. The heat pump will use some of the waste heat from these units if the heat pump is located in the room with the furnace. An alternative is to locate the heat pump unit outside, especially in climates that have a significant space heating load. There are heat pumps on the market that are designed to be located outdoors, generate hot water, and bring that hot water to tanks inside the building. The tank-based heat pumps are really designed for inside use, and they often will not work below 40 degrees Fahrenheit and can be placed outdoors in hot climates, but then you lose the ability to also use it for cooling. While tanks are very well insulated, there are some thermal losses, especially with tanks that also have a flue pipe. They can lose heat up the flue and cool down water when hot water is not needed. With the large tank, these flue losses can be significant. One can also expect a few percent of the heat to leave through the large insulated tank. Tankless water heaters heat water directly without the use of a storage tank and thereby zero out the tank losses as well as the flue losses. When the hot water tap is turned on, cold water travels through a pipe into the unit. Either a gas burner or an electric element heats the water. As a result, tankless water heaters deliver a constant supply of hot water. The downside is that the electrical service can be quite large to meet this very high demand for a short time. The same holds true for the size of the gas pipe to service this unit. Typically, tankless water heaters provide hot water at a rate of half to five gallons per minute, and gas-fired tankless water heaters can produce higher flow rates than electric ones. There are limits in how much hot water can be produced, however. For example, taking a shower and running the dishwasher at the same time may stretch a tankless water heater to its limit. In some cases, separate heaters are installed near different appliances, such as one by each bathroom and one near the kitchen. Solar water heating systems include storage tanks and solar collectors. There are two types of solar water heating systems, active, which have circulating pumps and controls, and passive, which don't. Solar water heating systems almost always require a backup system for cloudy days and times of increased demand. Storage water heaters usually provide backup and may already be part of the solar system package. A water heater's efficiency is determined by its energy factor, or EF. The energy factor is defined as the amount of hot water produced per unit of fuel consumed. The units for the numerator and denominator are the same, so the energy factor is dimensionless. Another important metric is the first hour rating, which is the number of gallons of hot water you can produce in the first hour. This is an indication of how quickly hot water can be produced by the system. Typically, electric water heaters have a lower first hour rating than natural gas water heaters and therefore often have a slightly larger storage tank. The energy factor is important to consider because water heating makes up 19% of the annual energy load in the average home. This energy use can be reduced in a number of ways, such as installing a water heater with a high energy factor. Other tips for saving energy with water heaters including using less hot water. This can be accomplished by reducing occupants' demand for hot water, by fixing leaks, or by installing more water-efficient appliances and low water faucets and shower heads. Another way is to wash laundry in cold water rather than hot water. You can also insulate the hot water piping. By insulating the first four feet of piping going in and out of the water tank, you minimize the thermal siphoning from that tank. So that's all for this episode, but please take a moment to review the references we've provided at the end of this episode. There are various links to the U.S. Department of Energy website where more information is available on water heating technologies. Please let us know if you have any questions, and thanks for watching.